uh, uh, Professor Malviya is the founder uh, member of this society because I know him for a long time and uh, he has been in picture. Now he has come back again and joined us. Dr. Anand Malviya uh, retired as a HOD of medicine and chief of clinical immunology and rheumatology services in All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. He was uh, uh, he's the head of uh, Department of Rheumatology, ISIC Super Specialty Hospital in New Delhi till September 2020. His major achievements uh, include founder member of uh, IAS, served at various positions in office bearers in IAS, discovered low dose methotrexate for uh, treatment of systemic autoimmune diseases, several ICMR awards, master ACR, APLAR, Honorary FRCP, MN Pasi Award, so many awards uh, for him, National Board of Examination Scroll of Honor and instrumental in getting clinical immunology and rheumatology as recognized by National Board and MCI and in getting the DNB DM courses started in the country. So these uh, were some of the generation of immunologists who actually set the ball rolling and taught immunology and started immunology, included GP Talwar and all these, you know, stalwarts, including Dr. Ganguly, Shobha Sehgal. Uh, I remember all that when we were young students. So he, uh, he has trained more than 50 students in rheumatology. Many of them at high positions have become professors in India and abroad. He has written so many chapters and many research papers, as you see, close to 500. 50 book chapters and the H index is very high, 40, and area of interest is rheumatoid arthritis, SPA, and SLE. So I hand over the uh, you know stage to Professor Malvia to please uh, moderate this uh, session on autoimmunity. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Sunil Arora. Um, all the 162 participants my greetings. I would like to thank the organizers, especially Dr. Sunil Arora, to remember us old timers who initiated immunology in India and um, for inviting me to moderate this session on autoimmune diseases. Um, I will just request the speakers um, the usual things that kindly be precise, be loud and clear with nice slides, and please do stick to time. Now, um, I would like to call the first speaker, in case I can have the speaker's uh, slide, please, so that I can introduce. Can somebody help me with that? Sir, uh, I, I sent you the profile. I don't have the slide for speakers. I have all for moderators. So sorry about that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I... There were so many things um, going on that uh, it is very embarrassing for me that I will not be able to introduce these speakers. I... Can somebody profile. help me on that aspect? I can do that. Please. Okay. I'm very sorry about it. No problem. Dipeman is... Uh... Okay, so I go about the biography. So uh, Dr. Dipeman Ganguly uh, is a principal scientist and associate professor at CSIR, Indian Institute of Chemical Biology, Kolkata. He has been trained uh, as a clinician and then moved to research. He did his uh, first PhD biotechnology from CSIR IICB in 2006 and his second PhD in immunology from UT MD Anderson Cancer Center, USA in 2020, uh, 2010. And after his postdoctoral stint in Columbia University, USA, returned to India in 2013. His research interests are a role of dendritic cells in uh, auto-reactive inflammatory context, molecular regulation of innate immune response, and role of mechanical cues in immune cells. Dr. Ganguly is a recipient of National Bioscience Award, DBT, 
2018, Mark Young Scientist Award 2019, CDRI Drug Research Award 2018, Swaran Jayanti Fellowship of DST in 2017. Uh, and uh, some more awards uh, he holds his credit to grant uh, granted us patents and several publications in eminent research journals like journal of experimental medicine science uh, translational medicine nature reviews in immunology nature immunology pnas trends in immunology and all so dr gangli led a csir sponsored randomized control trial on convalescent plasma therapy in covid-19 in india and also got interested in domain of immunopathology of covid-19 so that's that is uh, introduction uh, sir you can take over now thank you so much uh, dr uh, um, arora for helping me out uh, it is embarrassing there are so many things and especially the patients i just couldn't uh, do this uh, i invite dr ganguly now to start his talk very good afternoon to all of you and uh, or, or good morning thanks thanks for having me here uh, among this uh, uh, could you be louder please uh, thanks for inviting me um, to talk about something in this uh, with this very eminent speakers on the same platform um, and uh, it was really enlightening for all of us we are still students of immunology and um listening to as with the other audience listening to this eminent speakers had been quite ex- quite an experience so uh, my um, responsibility or my offering in this um, nice festival of immunology is uh, talking about autoimmune diseases and uh, the title goes like autoimmunity mechanisms and spectrum uh, but what i have decided uh, because there is no need to introduce autoimmune disease and different mechanisms from the basics to this audience so i thought that i'll just uh, talk about a, a shifting focus that we are experiencing in recent times to innate immunity uh, while talking about autoimmunity and that's um, that's been a, a 10 year old uh, thing that's happening uh, before that all of us know that autoimmunity we already had been talking about adaptive immunity in autoimmune pathogenesis and slowly we are getting our hand, hand on the innate immune regulations and innate immune dysregulation uh, in autoimmune i uh, hope i am audible yes yes you can be little okay. louder little louder will be better okay little yeah okay yeah so again um, so i i show this textbook picture of innate uh, or natural immunity as some Uh, textbookers uh, talk about it innate uh, immunity and adaptive immunity and all of us know about this we have been reading about this from very early days as being students of immunology but what i'll point to in this slide is this dotted line that separates it so we always uh, had this imaginary dotted line between innate and adaptive immunity but uh, the very fact that it's dotted have to be kept in mind so it's a continuum of response and each regulating one another and perhaps uh, i'll i'll talk about it much uh, later uh, but interestingly although the dotted line is uh, seeming more fainter and it's accumulating more dots in between uh, but still uh, in the in the line of evolution uh, really the adaptive immunity came much later and uh, it it, it started here which is uh, almost with vertebrates and so naturally their uh, the nature could actually do pretty well without the uh, proper adaptive immunity adaptive immunity regarding adaptive immunity we can say that the immunity which is cognize uh, the enemy that it is fighting with and in terms of the innate ones so they don't care whether the enemy is properly characterized if they have the id card of the enemy with them but they just fight them off so what i've decided i'll i'll first uh, uh, try to understand the history of this moving from uh, a lymphocyte centric immunological ideas to a more um, holistic immunological idea that has Uh, resulted in last 50 years in 6 7 slides and then moved to how uh, 
or in autoimmune spectrum or autoimmune disease um, uh, can be understood in little different way if we keep into um, consideration the redis regulations of innate immunity in those diseases well we, we again so i start start with this 1908 nobel prize in medicine uh, mechnikov ehrlich and they uh, mechnikov was talking about uh, certain interesting cells that was phagocyting foreign bodies and uh, Ehrlich was talking about uh, soluble factors that was very specific to few toxins in the body, right? And that's essentially represent this uh, two axis. And at that point of time, there was a solid line which slowly is becoming a more dotted line between innate and adaptive immunity. But the first uh, real theoretical effort came from uh, Frank McFarlane Barnett, who started thinking about it and tried to uh, figure out what are the things that immune system keeps in mind, or in terms of this imaginary mind, uh, that links between these lymphocytes and these macrophages. Well, they were not called lymphocytes and macrophages at that point of time, definitely, but they had this two different kinds of functions, how to integrate adaptive and innate responses. So the question essentially, so he asked that whether this the question is really me or not me. And well, when you are responding to me, that's where we have the topic of this talk, autoimmune disease. And when you are responding to not me, you are actually talking about protective immunity that, that uh, we were talking about in the last session where Dr. Kang elegantly talked about regarding infectious diseases. And uh, it was, we all know of those, all those things, but I just wanted to put all this uh, gradual improvement in our knowledge, gradual refinement in our knowledge in perspective. So Medaver, Barnett, and Joshua Lederberg, they first proposed the first effort at uh, a general model of immune system, how actually immune system works in 1959. Uh, they got the Nobel Prize for that. And again, that was a very lymphocyte-centric world, and they thought that lymphocytes are um, like educated early enough in life, and that's how they can recognize things that they encounter later in life as foreign, and, the, and they uh, keep in mind the central tolerance. So whatever they have seen pretty early in life, uh, they don't react to that. But that was a big problem. So, uh, so this is the self non self model proposed by Medawar and Barnett. And that's how we started a systematic uh, understanding of immune response. We pretty much much later than when Edward Jenner developed first vaccine. So vaccines came much before immunology came into being as a formal subject. But it, act, it actually cannot, uh, this model actually cannot explain a whole lot of things, like all the tumor immunology thing, you can't really explain. You don't expect how ch children are born and how they uh, can survive nine months in the mother's womb. Um, and then uh, this lymphocyte has been um, this, I mean, identified to have a very high peripheral mutation rates. And so if these lymphocytes, which were centrally educated, change themselves, yeah, then their education will be lost. And so this kind of issues came over and also how it actually you explain autoimmunity. <clears throat> and so it, it needed refinement and the first refinement uh, came by this uh, brilliant immunologist, Melvin Kahn, who uh, rather uh, more based on contemplation uh, proposed that perhaps there are certain licensor cells and well, he was on already only talking about licensing by another cell. He didn't talk about the T helper cell or it was not really defined in, in those terms at that point of time. And they, he said, he suggested if there is a licensing mechanism, perhaps this kind of enigma can be avoided. And that was the first modification to self non self model and the concept of rescue by signal two. Uh, so that was proposed in 1969. And we came to know about the real character of these uh, the licensing cells uh, as late as 2006 when follicular helper T cells were developed. So you can actually imagine how brilliant his contemplations had been. Uh, but it also could not um, uh, explain a whole lot of things because in early 70s and mid 70s, there were a whole lot of uh, seminal experiments being done in different parts of the world where they found that uh, T cells or lymphocytes were actually responding to much more vigorously uh, against uh, anti, I mean, antigens on uh, cells of its own species. 
then uh, when it's actually seeing antigen on cells, uh, which were uh, from a distant species in terms of evolutionary time point. And that means that there is a species specific proliferation signal that uh, was proposed by Cunningham and Lafferty. And we now know that this is, they were actually alluding to MHC restriction, which was discovered in 74. Uh, I mean, he was, they got Nobel Prize in 74 by Zinkernagel and Doherty, and uh, Alistair and um, uh, Kevin got the Nobel Prize in 1975. That was the first um, introduction of the, the concept of uh, innate cell regulating adaptive immune cells. So the, already the dotted line started to appear, and they, they termed them accessory cells, and they termed it co-stimulation. So this is the licensing added with the co-stimulation that was being offered to the lymphocytes. And that was how uh, things were controlled. So that uh, things which are not expected to happen should not happen. But again, um, then the question comes. So you already based all your self non-self recognition based on an early life education of the lymphocytes. And now you introduce another cell, which is actually licensing in the real world. And if it's licensing in the real world, it also has to got some means to understand what kind of antigens it's dealing with. I mean, it has to have an algorithm that will allow it to decide on licensing or not. And naturally, the question became why uh, APCs will provide co-stimulation for long, it was an enigma. Well, there were different proposals in between, but until in uh, 1989, uh, Charles Janeway uh, gave this idea that, well, the APCs will uh, do have a recognition module, uh, but they don't really recognize the antigens per se in terms of very specific antigens. Rather, they can actually distinguish between things that are, that are not of similar or closer evolutionary origin, and he termed it uh, pattern recognition module, right? So, so there will be pattern recognition receptors on these accessory cells, which are, by that time, we knew that these are antigen presenting cells, and which will uh, actually recognize molecular patterns from uh, distant or uh, evolutionarily distant species, which are pathogen associated molecular patterns, as he termed it. And now we know, uh, so this model was came to where he said that the non-self has to be infectious or molecular, or like evolutionarily distant to molecular pattern containing. And so the model was renamed into infectious non-self model. And this concept of PAMS and PRRs came. And again, the dotted line was getting even fainter. And now we know that there are a whole lot of uh, these pattern recognition receptors that have been uh, discovered. Uh, I, I uh, put the pictures of these two guys because a bit uh, among, I mean, between these two, they discovered a whole lot of uh, pattern re pathogen recognition receptors or pattern recognition receptors, which so are Bruce Butler and Shujiro Akira. Now, uh, the question uh, comes, well, uh, if, if you have receptors on the antigen presenting cells or accessory cells, which can only recognize patterns which are evolutionarily distant, still you can't really explain a whole lot of things, especially autoimmune disease, which is our problem in this talk. And um, that's why, uh, and, and also there are other uh, contexts where uh, this model cannot really help you. For example, graft rejection, where there is um, not much um, infectious pathogens around, and also the, uh, the graft, I mean, the, Origin incompatibility thing, right, in, in pregnancy. And so uh, that, uh, so this is kind of, um, this was a problem with infectious non-self model and this brilliant lady came forward and proposed that immune system doesn't really uh, think about whether it's dealing with something which is a pathogen or evolutionarily distant or not. And Pauli Matzinger proposed that immune system, what it is concerned about is whether something which is it, uh, it is an encountering through its receptors uh, are um, associated with a potential danger to the host cell. And uh, that's how the danger model came, so came up and uh, the PAMs are now um, kind of merging with damage associated or danger associated molecular patterns. And so we are actually moving from PAMs to DAMs. And now a lot of things could be actually uh, explained. And so, you can imagine, so this is 1994 when Pauli Merzinger is proposing uh, this danger model and our idea about how immune system works or rather what is it uh, in its mind which determines its functionality is still being questioned. 
that means the immunology is still we are actually we are not very sure we know the reductionist mechanisms and uh, small details very small details about immune system but we are not very sure how uh, the whole system is uh, positioned in the in the evolutionary standpoint why is it there and uh, i'll just for academic interest just to finish this discussion of uh, five ten minutes to a conclusion we're still thinking about it and well the uh, you know i mean after danger sig danger model was proposed there has been a whole lot of danger signals that has been dis uh, discovered hmgb1 l37 which is a antimicrobial peptide uric acids causing gout things like that hit shock proteins it's released it, it can actually induce in immune response uh, so we are still thinking about it. In 2013, there was another model proposed, which is antigen discontinuity theory. I'm not going into details, but the, but the question is, I mean, the point is that we are still thinking how immune system actually works. And maybe we have a whole, whole lot of information about small details, but the broader picture is not very clear to us. And this was proposed by Thomas Pradhu and Eric Vivier based on mostly NK cell biology. Inter I'll just, just for sake of fun, uh, you should know Thomas Pradhu is not an immunologist. He is a, he's a philosopher. And it was his PhD thesis on philosophy in Sorbonne University in Paris, uh, where he proposed this model. Anyway, so a whole lot of ideas are still roaming around on, on how immune system works. And so we are still in the search of this holy grail. We started our journey with Barnett 1959. In 2013, also there was new theories being proposed. So we are still not there. Now, uh, let us a little bit focus on the innate immune response. Innate immune response doesn't end with the accessory cells that was proposed by Cunningham and Lafferty in 1970s. Um, so there are now, we know, as, as I said, we know the small details about the immune system's um, uh, contexture and the architecture. And uh, so innate immune response is largely based on these four categories, right? First is a body boundary. You know the skin and mucosa. That's, that's, that's how uh, our boundaries, our organism is bound by this thing either skin or mucosa, right? There is no other thing. And uh, there is very, in we have very intricate details known about the, how the immune cells uh, populate these areas, these boundaries. And um, if you are talking about skin, there are keratinocytes. Keratinocytes do respond to different uh, antigens or pathogens. Um, they do uh, release biochemical mediators. I'll talk about them later, uh, which actually recruit immune cells. There are, so we already talked about, I mean, we already heard about different talks in this workshop about imprinting based on tissue, uh, uh, for tissue recruitment of of the specific immune cells. So the epithelial surfaces, both in mucosa and in skin, they uh, do have the ability to imprint recruitment signals on T cells or other immune cells. And they actually can uh, modulate the immune response and uh, decide how exactly the body boundary should respond to the impending pathogens or other kinds of danger. Then in the mucosa also, you know, I mean, there are a whole lot of uh, similar categories of uh, controls or regulators. Um, both this um, uh, skin and um, uh, mucosa are actually supported by um, secondary lymphoid organs where all the education will go on. I mean, for this audience, I'm not going into those details. I'm just want to, I just want to uh, uh, map the components of innate immune response that may play a role in autoimmunity. The second uh, part is definitely the cells, the cellular sentinels. And we uh, now we know a whole lot of cells are actually participating in the uh, innate immune response. I mean, starting from most cells, which are only we thought about in the allergic reactions, but now we know that, well, they actually do a whole lot of things other than allergies. Uh, macrophages, definitely, these are one of the earliest. Uh, even Mechnikov talked about them. Uh, and there are natural killer cells, dendritic cells, monocytes, different uh, flavors of monocytes, neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils, of course. And then, well, the cellular sentinels, uh, we know most, mostly how they crosstalk. And, and, and definitely these pattern recognition receptors, there are a whole lot of different kinds of them. They, uh, they look at different kinds of molecular patterns. 
uh, the molecular patterns can get generated by the pathogens, which are evolutionarily distant. Uh, the molecular patterns can be generated within the host body, uh, where a host cell tries to signal around, uh, tries to send a signal around that it is under stress for some reason, which may be infection or just injury. And, uh, and a whole lot of these dams and PAMs are slowly becoming into a uh, a very continuous spectrum of molecules uh, which kind of modulate like waves perhaps in the body uh, to maintain homeostasis in the body, recruiting different cells, orchestrating their recruitment in different tissues, and then uh, sending them off to secondary lymphoid organs so that they can educate other cells and cross talk with other cells and slowly um, kind of orchestrate the whole immune response. And finally, comes the other biochemical mediators, the most important of them are the cytokines. Again, this is becoming a textbook teaching of immuno immunology, right? But I think we have to keep in mind. So we all know about different cytokines. We know which are the cells which are producing different cytokines, but we always tend to forget the initial textbook teachings of how pleiotropic and how diverse and how redundant all the cytokines are. If we keep that in mind, then we'll perhaps um, get to know about the holistic understanding how a specific disease pathogenesis is actually controlled or they, um, they actually appear heterogeneous in, a, in the same uh, cohort of patient population and things like that. So I'll just let us remind us what are the different architecture the cytokines followed. And if you can, so this is a, a textbook uh, image from uh, Kubi's immunology, right? The first thing is pleiotropy, right? A cytokine can actually affect different functions. The major um, example of this in the context of, for example, we are talking about COVID at this point of time, virus infection is interferon. Just look, think about interferon. Interferon can do so many different things. They appear so diverse in their functional, functional dimensions. It signals neighboring uninfected cells to destroy RNA and reduce protein synthesis. It signals to certain infected cells to uh, commit apoptosis or commit suicide. It activates other immune cells. On the other hand, there are redundancy among different cytokines. For example, the classical example given by Kubi's textbook is IL-2, IL-4, IL-5. All of them drive proliferations. And there are synergy. Two cytokines can come together. If not, I mean, we are talking about two, but there may be 10 cytokines that can come together and affect a specific function. And in a, in a different, in a given patient, maybe the, that uh, synergistic module will have different numbers of cytokines with participation from different cytokines. And then finally, there are antagonisms. The same cytokines, I mean, uh, one cytokine can actually be present in the presence of another cytokine, which are actually in functionality, either directly or indirectly antagonistic, right? So all this network of crosstalk through these biochemical mediators, and if you, I mean, I'm not just going into details, just you can think of it as a body boundary is responding to some pathogen or some whatever danger signal, and it starts producing a cascade of cytokine reaction, and the cytokines, for example, say skin epithelial cell, yeah, they start producing IL-1 beta, TNF alpha, that, that recruits or activates neutrophils, macrophages, they produce secondary cytokines, they recruit other adaptive T cells, and there is no dotted line whatsoever. You can't really put a dotted line between innate and adaptive immune response, at least in this picture. I'll just give, because we are still uh, really traumatized with the pandemic that we are uh, going through and we are trying to understand how things are uh, happening. So let, let me give you an example of this in, in, the, in this uh, pandemic that we are having. So this is actually data generated by us from a cohort of Kolkata and in India. And so you just look, look at the mild disease. Huh? This is a mild disease, WHO progression score one to four, just fever, uh, malaise, fatigue, things like that. Uh, these patients are having and look at the so we are looking at actually 48 cytokines together and just look at those cytokines here all the cytokines are in the mild disease are taken as one value and you can see still so you're talking about 13 patients here still there are very nice correlative networks between these cytokines some cytokines are coming together some cytokines are not really coming together they are actually associated with other kinds of cytokines. 
So whenever you're talking about something, uh, immune context, and you're talking about these biochemical mediators called cytokines, you have to think of those correlative modules, uh, uh, which, which actually makes the cytokines either co-occur or uh, get separated in different contexts. Now you move to this severe disease, which is a little bit higher clinical progression score, people requiring oxygen, some kinds of device which is supplementing oxygen this, in these patients. And well, then uh, we actually never took patients with very severe disease, which are on ventilator or et cetera. Now, if you just look at their, so they have just progressed to acute respiratory distress syndrome, right? And they are going through a cytokine storm. Now we just look at the dense lines that we are looking at. Just, I mean, these are the very same cytokines. Just look at the dense lines that are connecting different cytokine dots. Look at the magnitude of, I mean, there is a differential magnitude of different cytokines. Some of them are very highly expressed, but uh, you can actually see some, those very highly expressed ones are actually correlated with few other cytokines as if they become a driver cytokine which drives the whole thing together. Now more cytokines try to participate in this correlative network and the things get worse. So as I said, I mean, the, the whole point I'm trying to make is we, we, we cannot really decide on a specific biochemical mediator that is driving a specific immune response. There will be different mediators and different uh, dimensions of uh, any, any immune response, right? And, and there are other biochemicals, for example, antimicrobial peptides, which uh, kind of roam, I mean, which is produced in the uh, body boundaries of skin and mucosa, uh, which were always thought that these are only against pathogens, but I'll, I'll talk about it later. We, now we are seeing that these are more general danger signals um, that these, uh, pro, these cells, which are actually lining the body from the environment, actually produce. And there are definitely complement system and which participate with different cells and different cytokines and try to mediate the final killing of cells. Uh, the host cells which are stressed, host cells which can pose danger to other host cells, it can actually kill them. And uh, so these are the things and also uh, we have in the recent times we have found that there are other innate um, uh, events uh, which may play a big role. For example, one of the most uh, interesting example is this neutrophil death, very peculiar neutrophil death where they, uh, they dedicate its genomic or DNA material um, to serve the innate immune response. It releases the DNA and where this, this is a very original picture from the original paper from uh, Zeklinski's lab where uh, these bacteria are trapped in the uh, netosis uh, or nets released by DNA nets released by uh, neutrophils. And there are definitely uh, more recent understanding about cells which are almost between innate and adaptive system. So it's, uh, these cells are actually obliterating all dotted line between innate and adaptive immune cells and their origins, hematopoietic origins are quite like adaptive immune cells. Their behavior is quite like innate immune cells. They don't care what they're actually looking at. They just uh, respond to different kinds of damage or danger signals that they experience while they are moving around in the tissue. And these are called innate lymphoid cells. This is, uh, this is uh, we don't have time to discuss about all of these. I think this audience knows about them. So the point is the axis, there always we talk about two axes of immune system, innate axis and adaptive axis. The axes are kind of merging together. And the axis is really getting a twisted conformation. The convolutions uh, come around this axis. And you are, if, when you are talking about different, I mean, like susceptibility to different clinical contexts, you actually look at this valley, right? So if you just plot the susceptibility to different immune context and the magnitude of innate immune response or other immune response, and then you actually reach a healthy valley here. In this valley, um, the, when the ball rolls to this valley, you are good. When the ball uh, shoots up there, you have autoimmune diseases. When the, body, uh, on the, when the ball uh, comes back here, you have susceptibility to infection or tumorigenesis, right? So this is a reduced immune response, heightened immune response. And this, uh, this rolling ball is actually represented by all these things, the genetics, epigenetics, environment, and holobiont. Holobiont means all the... Uh, microbes that are also uh, part of our whole body system. 
Uh, so I'll now I'll give you two specific examples from where we started appreciating about the innate regulation of autoimmune diseases. Diseases, and I'll, I'll uh, at, the, at, the, at the end I'll talk about it how this understanding has um, kind of revealed a very continuous spectrum of autoimmune diseases uh, out of their discrete clinical entity like uh, descriptions. So I'll just start with a story on uh, psoriasis. Psoriasis, all of us know, cutaneous inflammation. Mostly you knew about it as a T cell uh, infiltration uh, mediated disease in the skin. There is this acanthosis, finger like projections of epidermis, which are proliferating. A whole lot of cells are recruited in the cell, or a whole lot of immune cells are recruited in the dermis, uh, dermal region. And um, But there were very interesting um, observations pretty early in uh, like 18th century observations that if some one get, are getting this kind of clinical contact, like they are psoriatic patients, and if they get a recent injury, it seems that, uh, that the autoimmune response or the, this disease aggravates. And um, so this was first described by this clinician Heinrich Kovner, and this is called Kovner's phenomenon. And, uh, in, and when you are talking about uh, this injury, you can always think about release of uh, host cells. So when there is any injury, there will be host cell death. So that means the disease process per se is actually responding to host cell death. And um, by that time, I mean, in, in uh, like early uh, 2000s, uh, there was a very, um, very high focus on these kind of cells, which are called plasma cytoid dendritic cells, which are one of the dendritic cells which uh, uh, shared the lineage with other dendritic cells conventional dendritic cells, and they were found that these cells can actually respond to um, nucleic acid molecules. Their PRRs, they are pattern recognition receptors at least in humans, are restricted to TLR7 and 9, and they recognize different nucleic acids, and naturally, and, and they produce a whole lot of type 1 interferons. Naturally, they were mapped onto viral infections, antiviral protective immunity, uh, because they will detect all those uh, nucleic acid genomes. And, uh, but interestingly, people found that in the wound healing response also, they, um, they are really important. And that- Dr. Tells... Ganguly, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. You yeah. have 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes. And yeah. then your time finishes. Yes, 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 sorry. And uh, so they, uh, they can also respond to endogenous nucleic acids. And people started uh, looking at psoriatic patients and they found that these cells actually flock into psoriatic skin and people found there are um, uh, presence of nucleic acid remnants or host cell uh, nucleic acid remnants that are present. Highly in the thoracics, and they this nucleic acid and antimicrobial peptides form complexes like this, and which enters the PTCs. You can see they are actually present in the endosomal compartments, and they activate act, uh, interferon induction. And so we had this idea as psoriasis as we knew it. We knew that this was a T cell mediated disease. There is a whole lot of T cell infiltration in the skin, and keratinocyte activation and proliferation is happening. Uh, presumably in response to T cell derived cytokines, but slowly we got to this idea that there is an underlying innate immune activation event, which is perhaps earlier, but that actually uh, orchestrates the whole pathogenetic process. Now I'll just uh, briefly talk about a similar story in SLE, where uh, again, uh, SLE in 2011, as we know about SLE in 2011, this is a, a review by George Sokos, and uh, you can actually always, again, a very lymphocyte-centric view, right? Antibodies, immune complex, uh, cytokines being produced by lymphocytes, and they are affecting a whole lot of um, organs in the body, and that's it becomes a systemic autoimmune disease. And um, people have been trying over 40 years of genetic basis of SLE, but of the problem is almost all chromosomes have genetic uh, genes associated with SLE. Uh, they actually affect different immune functions, dendritic cell function, immune complex processing function, um, T cell function, B cell function. So you, it's very, very complex. So people decided, okay, this is a polygenic disease, a very complex polygenic disease. 
and there are mouse models so you can actually take homologous regions from humans and uh, put it in mouth i mean you can actually there are spontaneous lupus development in some mice which also have these polygenic regions which are associated with the disease process you can actually take out these contigs and put it in the wild type mouse you can create the disease um, in these uh, models and interestingly these regions are kind of redundant some of so these are three regions yes basic the study one two three mouse which is a very commercially available mouse you can actually take out one of one region still the disease persists maybe its character changes very little but the disease persists but this region seems to be redundant big contigs so one of the for example sle one region is almost 37 cm organ long it's a big chunk of dna which is associated with the disease interestingly there are also um, uh, evidence so there are monogenic lupus for example this gene was associated with you know in a familial form of lupus the outcome is very similar to a classical lupus disease but the only problem that this guy uh, these people have are uh, is a single mutation in dns one l3 gene and which is a again a nucleic acid processing enzyme which will degrade all the self nucleic acids now uh, so there is genetic and polygenic monogenic and polygenic understanding now look at this um, uh, paper on this work where they actually looked into monozygotic twins who share all their genetic material again one of the twin but so they were discord the discordant right so one twin had a celly another never had a celly and they actually looked at five such pairs and they found it's all about pattern in dna methylation so it's it's a very complex thing both genetics epigenetics um, uh, can play a role but the major point is the end result is very similar the tissue based outcomes are very similar and there have been a whole lot of uh, studies again, around these genes what are what are the genes and where exactly they are involved in the immune response and people have uh, mostly focused them into immune complex processing associated gene immune signal transduction associated genes because lymphocytes are involved b cells are involved and of course the innate immune genes whole lot of interferon pathway genes and interferons were actually being uh, brought into focus interestingly in um, 70s people have already found that um, in in sle with disease um, aggravation there is accumulation of type 1 interferons or interferon alpha in the circulating blood we never paid a lot of heed to them until uh, this was found jack mosro showed in a very interesting paper that this sle um, individuals have a very nice interferon signature gene expression and um, and that actually was correlated with the sled i score which is the disease activity score and he also found a very interesting signature of granulopoiesis that means some immature neutrophils are accumulating in the blood they are circulating in the blood in these patients and that um, led to this idea that maybe the neutrophil some kind of neutrophil death or neutrophil depletion is happening that's why this granulopoiesis signature comes up in the circulating blood because new neutrophils have to be many and people already as i said jiklinski's um, lab already discovered this netosis and then people found in sle there is immune response against nucleic acids anti dna anti rna antibodies are there and perhaps uh, uh, i have 3 you, minutes can you yeah you you need to wind up please we, we yeah 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 sure sure and so that people thought that i mean so this and maybe the nucleic acid antigen is coming from the neutrophils and now we know that this is the case i just go faster here and this uh, this uh, event this uh, interferon induction event seems to be shared in different diseases psoriasis sle rda jogren syndrome type 1 diabetes everywhere so it seems a specific innate immune event is actually shared by a whole lot of um, autoimmune diseases and it seems that there are very central innate immune activation events that leads to a very limited uh, amount of secondary tissue based outcome for example macrophage polarization t cell activation auto antibody production but in combination they are stochastic and combinatorial and that gives you different tissue based outcomes which are defined as different diseases and naturally you actually share with these innate immune events are actually shared by a whole lot of different contexts and so when you have this kind of central event you will expect that there will be co-occurring of these diseases co-occurrence of these clinical entities actually you have evidence for co-occurring 
uh, all these uh, co-occurrence of all these different autoimmune diseases that and uh, people have already talked about it that there are innate uh, mechanisms which are uh, co-occurring in this disease so i just end by saying that we we started thinking about autoimmune disease uh, with cues from adaptive immune response but the cues that adaptive immune response gives they actually undermines the spectral spread of the autoimmune diseases and they rather reveal the tissue specific pathologies on the other hand as we slowly understanding the innate immune dysregulations which are more often shared and when you talk about them they kind of connect the discrete clinical entities onto a spectrum so adaptive immune response actually explains the tissue based pathologies while the innate immune dysregulations which are shared they put or autoimmune diseases onto a spectrum uh, so i'll just end by uh, this i'll be happy to answer any question that may arise in your minds thank, thank you uh, dr ganguly that was most interesting especially the first part which uh, we clinicians have not kept up the second part of course we can discuss later and i will invite the next speaker and then we can have the question answers together for both the talks at the end now i invite uh, professor amita agarwal um she was the undergraduate from all india institute of medical sciences new delhi then she did the postgraduate in medicine from the same institution and i am happy to say she was my student when she did her medicine md um from then onwards she has had a brilliant career presently she is the head of the department of clinical immunology and rheumatology at sanjay gandhi institute of medical sciences lucknow um the detailed cv i will request dr sunil arora who has the details to say a few words okay sir uh, amita agarwal uh, is a professor and head of clinical immunology you are already told uh, in the sanjay gandhi institute of medical sciences she is a clinician scientist with major interest in juvenile arthritis and sle in addition she has taught a generation of phys physicians working in the field of rheumatology in india in recognition of her work she has been elected fellow of the indian academy of science national academy of science as well as national academy of medical sciences she has also served as president of indian rheumatology association as well as editor of indian journal of rheumatology back to you sir um professor amita you may like to start your talk and keep to time thank you i hope you are able to see my screen yes i am able to see okay good afternoon friends Uh, it's a i must thank uh, dr arora and the indian immunology society for inviting me to give this talk and uh, it's been a wonderful two days i have also learned and revised my immunology and the talks have been really brilliant so we move from the basic science to bedside we have had discussions on every aspect of immunology but whatever we do in the lab if it can help mankind that is what we all aim for so as dr pang said in the morning that vaccines are a very important thing and this is where immunology has contributed to improving the survival of our race it has prevented many infections and this is the data from cdc which shows that how much is a reduction by use of vaccines in cases as well as in the mortality and we are hoping the same for covid-19 however is it true for autoimmune diseases so as deepaman said that autoimmune diseases are a multifactorial diseases they have genetic basis on the top of that you have environmental triggers which lead on to generation of a benign autoimmunity and finally because of the effector mechanisms 
which we dealt in great detail, you have tissue damage. And once the tissue damage occurs, the patient comes to you with some symptoms. So what we can do for infections, can we prevent autoimmunity? We can't change our genes. At present, we haven't reached a stage of designer babies where we can use CRISPR-Cas or some technologies to have humans of the kind we want. So what else can we do? We can definitely change our environment. And there are multiple factors which have been linked to autoimmunity. The most important is smoking. So we definitely can ask most of our people not to smoke. Second, the bacteria, the environmental triggers, including the microbes. It varies from bacteria to viruses to some unknown microorganisms. We can definitely change that. Exposure to pollutants during early life, avoiding exposure to mothers, as well as reducing environmental pollution. Reducing sun exposure. We don't have great data to suggest that interventions like this make any difference, but we have epidemiological studies which show that there is increased incidence of autoimmunity when you have these factors present in the environment. Can we avoid the antigen? But unfortunately, in most autoimmune diseases, we really don't know the antigen the precise antigen, as we know in infectious disease. But in some diseases, we have had success. Like in celiac disease, you can prevent recurrence of acute rheumatic fever. So we've had success in prevention of autoimmune disease to a small extent. So we have done this study of looking at probiotics that is changing the gut microbiome in children with arthritis. And so these patients were matched in the beginning, before start in the baseline, the placebo and the probiotic group were similar, including their disease activity parameters, and when we studied them after three months of probiotic therapy, if you look at the changes in the immune parameters, the Th1 cells, the Th2 cells, the Th17 cells, and the tree reg cells, we didn't find any difference at all. We also looked at the cytokines in these children. There was no difference in cytokines, which was statistically significant. Even the clinical response was no different between patients who got the placebo versus the ones who got the probiotics. Did it change the gut flora? So the question was why we didn't see any response. So we also studied the gut flora after giving the intervention. And as we see that there is no significant difference in the bacteria which are there in the VSL3, which is a probiotic. So obviously we haven't used the correct probiotics Maybe we have not used in the correct dosage, or maybe we needed to give it for longer. And finally, maybe it doesn't work. So at present, use of probiotics to change gut microbiome still is in its infancy. Can we induce tolerance? Because if we can induce tolerance, we obviously can prevent a disease. This is a study which was done in rheumatoid arthritis. And, but however, even in this study, there was no difference seen by using oral collagen being given to patients with rheumatoid arthritis. This is a very interesting study where people have used oral insulin to induce tolerance in family members of patients with type 1 diabetes. We know that type 1 diabetes has a strong genetic predilection, plus it is associated with development of autoantibodies five to 10 years prior to development of diabetes. So this is a data set of almost 20 years of work where individuals who had the HLA type of susceptibility to IDDM and had at least two autoantibodies directed against, which are seen in type one diabetes, either islet cell antibodies, GAD65, and they were given oral insulin, 7.5 milligram of insulin for a long period of time. 
However, even in this, the development of diabetes could not be prevented. So these are four different cohorts which have been used. And if you see the overall result, the benefit of oral insulin is not significant. What it shows is that it is very difficult to induce tolerance to antigens in young adults or in even in children. So tolerance has to develop in vivo in our body to our self antigens prior. So can we induce tolerance to a disease when you have a disease state and modify the course of disease? So if you, this is one of the first human trials where dendritic cells pulse with the antigen were given to induce tolerance. So these are patients with rheumatoid arthritis where blood samples were taken and monocytes were purified, cultured in vitro with IL-4 and GM-CSF to change the cells to dendritic cells. And what they have done is they've used this compound to cause dendritic cells, which are tolerogenic dendritic cells. And then they have pulsed them with the antigen in rheumatoid arthritis. The citrullinated antigens are supposed to be the probable antigens. So once these pulse DCs were re-injected into the patients, and it is assumed that these citrullinated antigens will be presented by the HLA, which is the susceptible HLA. And we hope that we will see a T cell response to these antigens. And what is shown, they term this vaccine as Rheumavax because it's being given in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And what it shows is that the pro-inflammatory response to this autoantigen, which is a citrullinated vimentine, came down at one month after the vaccination, while in controls, there was no significant difference. Similarly, there was difference in the T regulatory cells the effector cells came down and the ratio of T regulatory cells to T effector cells increased in individuals who received this vaccine. However, the follow-up was very short and it was only a proof of concept study. So there is a phase two study now being in pipeline to see can we induce tolerance and cause skewing of immune response from T effector cells to T regulatory cells to cause amelioration of disease. work by multiple different mechanisms. They can produce inhibitory cytokines, they can kill T effector cells by cytotoxic mechanisms, they can compete for binding to dendritic cells so that the effector cells doesn't get activated, or they can deprive the T effector cells of IL-2. And there are multiple ways to expand T regulatory cells. One Obviously, what we do in the lab when we do experimentation, you can take cells from patients, you can sort out the T regulatory cells by using markers like CD25 and CD127, and by giving T cell stimulation and giving IL-2, because you know that CD25 is a high affinity IL-2 receptor, and that will cause expansion of these T regulatory cells, and these expanded T regulatory cells can then be put back into the patient. But this is a very tedious job. And it requires that from each individual, the therapy will have to be absolutely individualized. So this has been done in patients with graft versus host disease, but in other autoimmune disease, it is very rarely used. The other way is that we know that IL-2 is a very important cytokine for T regulatory cells, and it causes expansion of T regulatory cells. In addition, IL-2 has an inhibitory effect on T follicular helper cells. Which Dr. Shiv talked to you on day one, that these are the cells which are very, very important for germinal center reaction, as well as for causing self-reactive B cells to develop, both 
in the geminal center as well as in the extra follicular areas. And these are the ones which give rise to plasma cells which produce autoantibodies. So you have autoantibody production, which causes immune complex formation, and then this vicious cycle of immune complexes activating the dendritic cells, which cause T cell activation, and this whole cycle keeps on going. And finally, you get breakdown of tolerance and development of autoimmune disease. So can we replace IL-2? Because people have shown that in autoimmune diseases, there is sometimes very low IL-2 in individuals. So does this IL-2 therapy work in the clinic? So this is a study which has just recently come where patients with lupus were given low dose IL-2 and the gray bar show you three times the treatment has been given with IL-2. And if you look at, this is the response criteria, the patients who received IL-2 therapy had a better chance of response, that is 60% response as compared to about 30% in ones who received placebo. This is another disease activity score, which again shows that it comes down in individuals who received low dose IL-2. And almost 50% of patients receive reach complete response. In addition, we are also able to reduce their corticosteroid dose. We know that corticosteroids are drugs which are associated with potential side effects. So low-dose IL-2 therapy is a very promising therapy which can increase Tregs and may cause improvement in disease. So does it really cause increase in Tregs? So if you see in the same patient group, they have shown that there is no change in overall CD4 and CD8 cells, but there is increase in Tregs, but it is only sustained for a short period after the IL-2 therapy is stopped. And IL-2 also causes an increase in the NK cell numbers. So this is one promising therapy which we have, which targets the T regulatory cells by increasing their proliferation in vivo rather than what we were doing earlier in vitro expansion. The most important success which has happened in the history of autoimmune disease therapeutics is the monoclonal antibodies. And this bar diagram shows that how much is the increase in the utilization of these monoclonal antibodies. So the market is worth about 120 billion US dollars. We agree that the cancers, are, the oncology is using a lot more monoclonal antibodies, but autoimmune disease, which is shown in the brown color, is also a major component where monoclonal antibodies are being utilized for patient care. So Deepa Van showed you this picture of co-stimulation. So you have the autoreactive T cell, you have the B cell, and they interact by co-stimulatory signal, and the B cells get activated, they produce antibodies, they also produce cytokines. Similarly, the T cell can also produce cytokine. And we have antibodies which can block at any step. We have antibodies which can kill the autoreactive T cell. We have antibodies which can kill the autoreactive B cell. We have antibodies which can block co-stimulation. We have obviously a plethora of antibodies which can block the cytokines. So we will see how successful they are in clinical practice. For killing the T cell, you can either use anti-thymocyte globulin, that means it will remove all the thymocytes. You can use anti-lymphocyte globulin, which will kill all the lymphocytes, both the T cell and B cell. But these are very, very therapies which are highly immunosuppressive. So these are predominantly used for diseases which have very high mortality, like aplastic anemia, which, is, which also has an autoimmune basis. So in these conditions, when we use this kind of immunosuppressive therapy, you can have a success rate of about 75 to 80%. For B cell depletion, there are multiple agents available now, and B cell therapies are predominantly useful in autoimmune diseases, which are driven by autoantibodies. But we all know that B cells not only produce autoantibodies, but they have many more functions like antigen presentation. And by presenting the antigen, they can also have effect on the T cell. So these are the antibodies which are available. You can have antibodies which block CD19, Epiletizumab, which blocks anti-CD22. You have Rituximab, which is the most widely used 
B cell depletion therapy, which binds to CD20. Also, you have humanized anti CD20 antibody, and you have antibodies to CD52, which also depletes B cell. How do these antibodies work? These antibodies, after they bind to the B cell, can cause ADCC mediated killing or they can cause complement dependent cytotoxicity so that kills the b cell or they can be they can directly cause apoptosis of the b cell because of the changes in the cell membrane of the b cell and as i said earlier that the, we have a great crosstalk between b and t cell and it's a feed forward loop which is sustained in patients with autoimmune disease so when you use b cell depletion therapy that prevents the further expansion of the effector T cells. And in addition, it also causes the regulatory T cell because the load of the effector T cell comes down, the regulatory T cells are able to now cause suppression of those reduced number of T effector cells. And further, it's been shown that after you have B cell lymphopenia, when you have regeneration of B cell, it is likely that the repopulation occurs with the regulatory B cells and the regulatory B cells then suppress the autoreactive B cells. So how effective is this therapy in the clinic? We are using it day in, day out, but these are the earlier trials. This is a trial which was published in 2004 in NHEM, which shows that in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, if you use rituximab, this, is our, this was our standard of care, methotrexate, which used to give us a response rate of about 30% to 40%. When you use B cell depletion therapy, the response rate jumps up to about 65 to 70%. So that is the kind of difference these therapies make, almost doubling of the response rate. And this therapy causes a dramatic reduction in B cell. So the B cell depletion occurs within a matter of two weeks and it is sustained for about six months. And some patients can have B cell depletion even lasting for a year. What it helps is to reduce drugs like prednisolone in patients with lupus you can have or patients with vasculitis who require very high doses of corticosteroids. There you can have marked reduction in dosage of prednisolone their disease activity comes down. So the B cell depletion therapies using rituximab have now become standard of care for serious diseases like vasculitis. They are being used in patients who are refracted to therapy in patients with lupus and in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. The problem with using therapies which are targeting B cell are that the long lived plasma cells are not targeted. So you get repopulation both with regulatory B cell as well as the autoimmune clone comes back. So this is a paper which got published last week where they have tried to use CD38 targeted antibody. CD38 we know is a marker which is present on the plasma cell. So even though it's tried in two patients, so this is a patient with lupus where the kidneys were involved and the patient had proteinuria and so many therapies had been tried, nothing was working. And when this anti-CD38 antibody was used, or came down in both the patient. So this shows that plasma cell depletion is another potential therapy which can be utilized. And when you obviously remove the plasma cells or deplete the plasma cells, there is a reduction in the production of autoantibodies. And they looked at antibodies to infectious agent or antibodies to agents to which we have been vaccinated. So though there was a reduction in the anti-tetanus antibodies, it still stayed in the protective range. So showing that this therapy is probably is safe. Now coming on to the cytokines. Lieberman said that the cytokines are very pleiotropic. They have multiple functions. So anti-cytokine therapies have been utilized for long. And we have plethora of cytokines. So is the plethora of antibodies which are available to us to block each and every cytokine. Let's look at the two most important cytokines, which are the effective cytokines, especially in diseases which I deal with, that is arthritis and lupus. So this is a study where they have shown result of anti-TNF antibodies, which block TNF. 
in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Again, the standard of care, you get a response rate of about 20%. With anti-TNF therapy, you get a response rate of about 50%. And this is study using It is very good response, like patients who have 70% response, almost near remission, is seen in about 30%. And a very good response is seen in about 45%. So these two therapies are also now standard of care in clinical practice across the world for patients with rheumatoid arthritis. We also know that IL-17 is a very important cytokine for autoimmunity. Deeperman has shown you a figure of skin with keratinocyte. So that is a model which is used for psoriasis. So this is, you can see in the picture, the skin plaques, which are characteristic of psoriasis. So here, IL-17, IL-23 axis is much more important. So there, if you use IL-17 blocking antibodies, you can get a success rate of about 75%. So psoriasis has been a real success story as regards anti-cytokine therapy. They, you can see that the skin has absolutely cleared over a period of time. The IL-23 antibody is also available. And again, that in psoriasis, it gives you a success rate of about 80%. Because both IL-23, IL-23 acts on the IL-23 receptor, acts on all the IL-17 producing cell, which produces IL-17. So either you can block IL-23, or you can block IL-17, you get almost similar results. But the data is different when you use certain other autoimmune disease, where IL-23 therapies may work, but IL-17 therapies do not work. So there is redundancy, there is different, depending on which is the site, which is the organ involved. So it's not that you can apply the same immunological principles to every autoimmune disease. So Deepaman had place a lot of emphasis on innate immunity. So the plasma cytoidentic cell in lupus produce a large amount of interferon. And lupus has been a story where we haven't been able to get many therapies. Most of the therapies with other anti-cytokine therapies were failures. So now, once these anti-interferon antibodies have come in, this is a cephalizumab study, which you see, it has given you a good success rate. This is a study which published this year. So it's called TULIP2. That's why you see the TULIPs there. So patients who were treated with anti-interferon antibodies showed much better response. And the response came very early, within a matter of eight weeks. And it was where most of the other therapies had failed. Still, biologics are a different cup of tea because they all need cold chain, they are difficult to manufacture, and they are expensive, which are beyond the reach of population in our country. So can you have some oral therapies? So people have looked at JAK inhibitors because JAK inhibitors are molecules which can be made by pharma, and these are like tablets. So obviously, anybody would like to take a tablet rather than take injections. So we have multiple JAK inhibitors now available in the market, and which are either pan-JAK inhibitors, or they are selective, or at least partly selective. So you have a partly selective JAK2 inhibitor, which is tofacitinib, or you have pan-JAK inhibitors like filgotinib or baricitinib. Baricitinib is also mostly a JAK2 inhibitor. And if you look at the data with JAK inhibitors, the success rate is 70%. So this is a study with tofacitinib in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. 70% of patients show you response. And this is a study with baricitinib. And here, this is where the world is going. You are now comparing these drugs like JAK inhibitors, which are tablets, with monoclonal antibodies. So this is a study where baricitinib is compared with anti-TNF therapy. And it is actually superior to anti-TNF therapy. So probably in next five to seven years, we would have 
that these jack inhibitors or small molecule inhibitors of kinases the most promising of which is jack inhibitors will take be the center stage of therapy in patients with arthritis and this is summarizing what we have learned over the last 15 years that you have therapies like this is showing you the co stimulatory blockade using abatacept which gives you about a very good response the major advantage of co stimulatory blockade is that the side effects are very very minimal as compared to anti tnf therapy or if you look at this is the your il6 therapies these are b cell depletion therapies and these are jack inhibitors so they are all comparable and it because of heterogeneity of patients we are not seeing success rate of 90 to 100% because some patients the immune response is driven by il6 in some the immune response is driven by tnf alpha so that is why with each of these therapies 40 to 70% of patient show you response then coming on to the cellular therapies can you use mesenchymal stem cells so we know that mesenchymal stem cells can work across hla barriers they can be given off the shelf they are not like bone marrow transplant and they have overall a very severe immunosuppressive effect on all type of immune cells so they are potent immunosuppressive effect the clinical data on mesenchymal stem cell in autoimmune disease is very very limited and most of it is from china and south korea so i've just taken one study which is in patient with lupus and where umbilical cord mesenchymal stem cells were given and you see that over time there is reduction in the clinical score and there is reduction in the autoantibody level but however the response is only modest and we don't have large data set to say that will these therapies be useful or not they have also been used in patient with rheumatoid arthritis where again umbilical cord stem cells have been given there is some reduction in the disease activity score and in improvement in their physical functioning but we still need to wait for larger trials before they can come to the clinic then can we deplete antigen specific b cells because they are the ones which are producing antibodies but for that first we need to know the antigen and second we need to know how we can isolate those auto reactive b cells so for detection people are trying to make nanoparticles or they are using the stepped avidin biotin systems with fluorescent tag to get the isolate the auto reactive b cells and then either you can sorry amita we have 10 more minutes for you yes i i finish in time sir so you can either use deletion by using nanoparticles which have complement activating peptides on that and these peptides will be recognized those by the b cell which has the receptor for this peptide and then it will cause complement mediated cytotoxicity or you can use silencing that the auto peptide is being recognized by the auto reactive b cell because of the bcr on it and then you it is tagged with an antibody which cross links it to the inhibitory fc receptor so that will cause silencing of the auto reactive b cell and can we use car t cells the car t cells are now in fashion they are being used for tumors and there they have shown a great success but for autoimmune disease they are still in infancy and this is a paper which came just a few weeks ago where they have tried to delete auto reactive b cells from rheumatoid arthritis patients and they have used a very nice strategy so you identify the auto reactive b cells you make a universal car t cell that is a car t cell which will recognize fitc so that it can be used for any other any autoimmune disease and then you have fitc labeled auto antibody positive peptides that is the antibodies the peptides which are being recognized by the anti auto antibodies so you have to know that and then you label it with fitc so this because now this is a peptide which is an which is being recognized by the b cell which is producing that auto antibody so this peptide which has got fitc tagged will bind to the auto reactive b cell which is producing that auto antibody and this car t cell which is recognizing the fitc which is against the fitc will then bind to the fitc and will eliminate the auto reactive b cell 
So this is a very novel technology and we hope that in future we'll see a lot more work in CAR T cell targeted therapies which will help us delete the autoreactive B cells. So we have seen over this last 30 minutes that prevention is the best, but we don't have much. Smoking cessation probably is the best thing. If I have my way, I think we should just ban smoking across the world. Can we do antigen change? Probably not. And can we induce tolerance? We haven't done much of success in that. Still, people are using tolerogenic dendritic cells pulsed with antigen, but it, it is still in its infancy. So this first hit, that is a breakage of tolerance, we are still in experimental phase. Then if you look at T-cell activation, you have co-stimulatory blockade. You can use JAK inhibitors, which prevent T-cell activation. For B-cell, the therapy which is most promising and which is in the clinic is a rituximab, that is a B-cell depletion therapy. And BTK inhibitors are being used in refractory cases. Then autoantibodies, obviously, if you use B-cell depletion therapy or you use therapies which are directed at plasma cells, you can reduce antibody formation. And co-stimulatory blockade also, because it prevents T and B-cell interaction, it reduces the production of antibodies. And not to forget the innate immune system. The innate immune system, the macrophages and the polymorphonuclear cells, they produce a lot of cytokines and we have inhibitors of TNF, we have inhibitors of IL-6, we also have inhibitors of IL-1. However, IL-1 therapy did not show very great results in patients with autoimmune disease, so it's not being used much. And again, the JAK inhibitors also inhibit the innate immune system. There is some thought which is ongoing at this time that despite for the last 30 years, we are targeting the adaptive immune system and we are also targeting the innate immune system, we have not reached that kind of success. So should we be targeting non-immune cells to have better control of autoimmune disease? So there are some work now going on to target, like in patients with arthritis, the synoviocytes. So if we target synoviocytes, can we have better control of inflammation as well as autoimmunity? Because they may be the provider of autoantigens. So I have an elusive dream that could we be possible sometime in future to identify patients who are at risk of developing autoimmunity? And if we can do something to prevent autoimmunity, can we have some simple measures Smoking is one, but some more simple measures which can prevent autoimmunity. Would it be possible ever to induce antigen-specific tolerance in patients at risk or in healthy individuals at risk? If that is not possible, can we do early treatment by immunological mechanisms to induce antigen-specific tolerance? Or if that is also not possible, can we have non-toxic immunosuppressive therapies which can benefit our patients but not cause side effects. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor Amita Agarwal. That was very lucid, easily understood uh, talk. We have uh, time for question and answer for both the uh, talks that were there, Dr. Ganguly's talk as well as Professor Amita Agarwal's talk. Um, I can open the questions and uh, we can start. Um, let us see who will be the person to answer. I want to ask if cytokines have dual roles, like if one cytokine acts anti-inflammatory in one condition, can it act like as a pro-inflammatory in another tissue mi uh, microenvironment? For example, IL-6, what factors decide its role as a pro or anti-inflammatory? I think this will be answered by Dr. Ganguly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we will have very rare um, examples where a single cytokine is actually behaving in two ways. Um, perhaps the basic question of uh, pro and anti-inflammatory uh, cytokine, or rather targeting one single protein into this two uh, duality, pro or anti-inflammatory 
uh, may have to be revised slowly, but it, we, we are slowly understanding that it's all about um, a specific balance of different cytokines because cytokines will talk to cells on the through the receptors on those cells. And finally, uh, how a specific cell is getting differentially recruited to the tissue and how they are cross-stuffing with other cells are defining the outcomes. The answer, simple answer is, usually we have categorized cytokines into pro and anti-inflammatory uh, effects. We don't really have a whole lot of example of a single cytokine acting as um, anti or pro-inflammatory effect other than perhaps interferon beta. So interferon beta has been shown um, to uh, affect tissue-based outcomes uh, mitigating inflammation and also in some cases driving inflammation. But again, you can't really mark it as an anti-inflammatory cytokine. It's all about how it is orchestrating the immune response around it. So can Thank I you. add uh, something, sir? So yes, like please. IL-6, you've asked about IL-6. So IL-6 is a pro-inflammatory cytokine, we all know. But if IL-6 works with TGF-beta, if in the milieu you have TGF-beta, it can cause production of expansion of T-regulatory cells. So the milieu definitely decides how the cytokine is going to work. Like IF and gamma, we always think it's a pro-inflammatory cytokine. But when IF and gamma was blocked, patients with multiple sclerosis had enhancement of their symptomatology. Because we thought that they had T, because there it caused much more of TH17 response was there. So it is, I mean, cytokines are a very complex network. And Vipavan showed you that COVID-19 story, that how network they are. So if you change one, it can have imbalance on many more things. So the milieu really decides how the cytokines work. But as Deepaman said that if it binds to its receptor, generally it does the same. But how many receptors are engaged on the cell by different cytokines, that decides the fate of that cell. Uh, similarly, I think uh, IL-17 also is a bit uh, an, of an uh, enigma. If it is produced by TH17 cell, it seems to work differently in ankylosing spondylitis than if IL-17 is produced by non-TH17 um, yes. cells. And then finally, the tissue milieu itself can also change the way a cytokine works. In an IL-17, it is quite clear that in different tissues, in different stages of inflammation, it has a little different action. So I think as, you, as everyone is talking about, cytokines are fascinating. And I think we have to learn a lot more about their interaction with each other and with the tissues and the situation in which that tissue belongs to. I mean, this is some of the things that I can also add. The next question is um, by Dr. S.S. Prakash. Can autoimmune diseases be classified based on which arm, innate or adaptive, of immune system drives the pathology? Dr. Amita. As uh, I mean, you have seen the networks which go on. So there is really no divide between innate and adaptive immune system. Each one is dependent on each other. What we can say that predominantly, like if you look at lupus, lupus, we always used to think it's an adaptive immune system driven disease because there was so much of autoantibody. There were a plethora of autoantibodies. And when we have learned, we have found that it's actually not that. It is the type 1 interferon disease, which is being produced by plasma cytoidentitic cell, which is part of the innate immune system. So these are absolutely interlinked, and I don't think we should be classifying autoimmune diseases as diseases which are innate or adaptive. Actually, the classification now has changed to autoinflammatory diseases, which are totally driven by innate immune system. There are diseases which are driven by innate plus partly adaptive. These are like spondyloarthropathies. These are at the border of autoinflammation, which is driven totally by innate immune system. And then you have diseases like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, where the component of innate is a little less and adaptive is a little more. So it is how much is a share, but both of them work in every disease. I think um, Dr. Ganguly had answered this in a very beautiful way, that innate lymphoid cells have really changed the whole thing. And I think innate and acquired adaptive is now disappearing slowly. And in uh, diseases, I think either it is auto-inflammatory or autoimmune, as uh, Dr. Amita said. The next question is by Dr. M.F. Khan. Infection may or may not proceed to disease. Can we screen the weak root of immune response generation 
in the host with disease. If we can, we may discover or develop some therapeutic or immunological strategies to boost the uh, weak side of the immune army. I think here, let Dr. Ganguly start and maybe then Dr. Amita can add to it. Yeah, I think I'll just give a single uh, sentence answer. Uh, so these question pertains to precision medicine, okay? So you have to figure out what exactly is happening in a given patient. And uh, problem is in the uh, clinical laboratory medicine, uh, we have not progressed so much so that we can actually take a little bit of blood and talk about the whole uh, architecture of how the disease is, I mean, how the body, host body is responding to a particular clinical entity. Uh, so the question uh, should be answered by precision medicine, uh, but I think uh, Dr. Amita will be uh, yeah, expanding on it. So the question you have asked is infection may or may not proceed. That's right. So what I said, if you are talking of the environmental trigger, so it has been postulated that there are some infectious agents which can trigger autoimmunity in certain cases. Like I gave you an example of acute rheumatic fever, where it has been proven beyond doubt that the streptococcal infection, because of cross-reactive antigens in the myocardium and the valve, lead on to autoimmune phenomena against the valvular tissue antigens as well as the myocardial antigens, and the patient presents to you with myocarditis and valvular dysfunction. So in those patients, if you treat, you get good response. But in other situations, we are thinking that infection may or may not be contributory. And what you are saying is that to look at weak side of immune response, we have not defined that what in the agent is can cause into autoimmunity. We haven't understood that. And it is there are very few human models where infections have been absolutely shown to trigger autoimmunity. And as I said, acute rheumatic fever is the most important example. Even there, we don't understand who is going to develop and who is not going to develop. So that enigma will always stay. Uh, Dr. Khan asked another question, uh, same question, and said that Dr. Amita will answer. I think now you have already answered. So I can now take the other question, Dr. Rakesh Sharda's question. Uh, um, sorry, Dr. Rakesh Sharda. Yeah. What probable role, there is some, uh, I think. Um, in immunity, yeah. In immunity, trained immunity. Uh, okay, immunity could have in occurrence or recurrence of autoimmune disorder. This is a new uh, word, I didn't know about it. Maybe um, somebody can answer the question so Dr. I also Amita, understand. Please. Dr. Amita, please. <laughs> do you want to go? I, no, no, trained no, immunity. Yeah. Trained immunity is basically an immunity. Oh, it is trained, so it was a, a spelling. So trained immunity oh. is immunity which is kept in your innate immune system, like what we are talking about BCG vaccination in COVID nineteen. Oh. That because people who have been BCG vaccinated, at least in Europe, data from Europe shows that they had less COVID nineteen severity. So that your immune, uh, innate immune system is much more activated and you generate a more robust immune response. So that is one of the postulation that why females have much more of autoimmunity because it's been seen that women have more longevity, women have a more robust immune system, they generate a much better innate immune response. So that could be one reason why females have much more of autoimmunity. So I don't know if I have partly answered your question. So occurrence of autoimmunity, there is, this is the only data set we have. But recurrence of autoimmune disorder, I don't have much. So Dr. Chen may have something to answer if he has something to add. No, okay. okay. Uh, I take the next question by Dr. Panda. What is the mechanism behind the smoking induced development of autoimmune diseases, Professor Amita? So the mechanism behind uh, smoking causing uh, or linked to autoimmune disease are multiple. One, when you smoke, your epithelial barrier is poor. You are likely to have more antigens going inside. That is one. Second, that smoking is also supposed to lead on to more citrullation of antigens. So especially in rheumatoid arthritis, it's been seen that smoking causes citrullation of antigens which are present in the 
lungs. And lung is supposed to be the site from where the disease actually starts, which actually ma finally manifests in the joint. But lung is the site where you get citrullination of antigens. That causes production of autoantibodies to citrullated peptides, and that causes the cascade of events. And smoking is also supposed to be a pro-inflammatory stage. So that leads on to the further propagation of inflammation. So these are the three mechanisms by which smoking is supposed to be linked to autoimmune disease. So that is exposure of autoantigens by causing tissue injury, exposure to environment, more environmental triggers, change of antigens, self-antigens by causing citrullination and a pro-inflammatory milieu. Uh, Dr. Sharda has one more question. I think partially you had answered in your talk. Mm -hmm. The question is on probiotics and prebiotics are reported to have positive immune equil equilibrium restorative effects. Can prebiotics and pro, um, uh, phago um, geo, geom um, help in restoring immune homeostasis and hence autoimmune disorder? I think you showed in your slide that yes. although theoretically it is um, possible, but when it was done experimentally, it didn't show much. So the data is uh, very limited. We were very, very hopeful because we know that we are all tolerized to the gut antigens. So it was believed that uh, the, when you change the gut flora, the gut flora also basically impacts by changing your gut permeability, giving you more Tregs. So if you have a good gut flora, if you have an altered gut flora, you are likely to have a more pro-inflammatory milieu. Your activation of ILC3s, which produce IL-17 and more of TH17 and less of Tregs. But uh, the clinical efficacy at present is very, very limited. Use of antibiotics have not shown much results to change the gut flora. Or, and use of probiotics is still in its infancy, except in inflammatory bowel disease, where some success is being shown by use of probiotics. Another question by Dr. Sharda, can we repurpose immunosuppressive drugs other, other than corticosteroids for therapeutic purposes in COVID-19? I think this was discussed in quite a bit, both by Dr. Ganguly and you. So but I can maybe... just add that there, there are many drugs which are being re, not repurposed, they are being tried. But that if you look at robust data, nothing except corticosteroid has shown benefit in mortality. But for use, people have used tocilizumab, which is IL-6 blocker. People have used IL-1 blocker, anakinra. People have, there are trials going on baricitinib, which is a JAK inhibitors. People are also thinking of using anti-TNF because it's been shown that patients who are being treated with anti-TNF for other indications like rheumatoid arthritis and others had probably a lesser severity of disease. So these are being repurposed, but we don't have robust data at present. Dr. Shivani Yadav has a question to Amit Agarwal. Um, when the B-cell depletion therapies are used, uh, targeted against plasma cells, does that also affect the vaccination status of the patient? Like if the memory of any past vaccination would also be depleted? Yes. So that has been a major concern. And that is why the anti-CD20 therapy was supposed to be, because we are treating benign diseases. We are not treating malignancies. So anti-CD20 therapy was being utilized. The only problem with that therapy is that when you, that you are not killing the long-lived plasma cells, because the plasma cells don't express CD20. And there is a relapse of disease. So what we do nowadays in clinic is we are giving every six months maintenance therapy with B cell depletion. So some people have thought that can we use bortezomab, which is a proteasome inhibitor, which again causes depletion of plasma cell, or you can target using antibodies to CD30 or antibodies to 138. That concern which you have is always there because whenever you deplete long-lived plasma cell, the memory cells of the previous vaccination will also go away. But as I showed you the data, that those two patients, they, the antibodies to tetanus definitely came down, but they were still in the protective range. And people believe that you have the T cells, the memory T cells. So if you need it, the memory T cells will help the B cells to produce the protective antibodies if need arises to that infection. But still that concern which you, Shivani, have, we also have. So that is why they have not come into major use. Thank Dr. you. Mal can we, uh, can we uh, limit the questioning now because there is one more speaker in the session. He's okay. waiting. Okay, okay, okay. Um, 
Let me just uh, quickly see anything out of these a lot of molecular mimicry, role of molecule. How successful is that for gene controlling inflammation? Sir, what is your thought about vitiligo? Lego? What are the JAK inhibitors and inhibitors? Um, there are a large number of questions, and I think so. I can I answer them in the question answer section. Exactly, I just answer I, them on the chat. It's I think yeah, then yeah, uh, we will have yeah. to invite uh, close this session and invite the next speaker, um, Dr. Uh, Sunil Arora. Please help me again. Okay, I will do that. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Nian Chen, uh, who is uh, associate professor. Institute of Microbiology and Immunology, National Ying Ming uh, University in Taiwan. So Nian Zheng has been a scientific associate in the Campbell, Fam Campbell Family Institute for Breast Cancer Research, uh, University Health Network, Toronto, Canada. He joined as assistant professor in the Institute of Microbiology uh, and Immunology National Ying Ming uh, University in 2007, I think, and became associate professor in 2014. He is currently chief of project management section, Office of Research and Development, National Ying Ming uh, University, Taiwan. His main research interests are mechanisms of inflammation and kidney, <coughs> chronic kidney uh, disease. He has been awarded with the Award of Excellence in Teaching by the National University. He has published in peer-reviewed journals of repute. So uh, back to you, Professor Malvia, to start this session, please. We, we can mail all the questions which were there in the mailbox to Dr. Uh, Dipeman as well as uh, Mita Agarwal so they can respond to the people individually. So we, we will have them copied to your emails. Dr. Chen, your slides are now visible. Okay. Can you hear me? You are audible. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Thank you for organizer uh, for inviting me uh, to have a talk here, and uh, uh, my um, main major uh, major project is uh, focused on the inflammatory regulation in disease and uh, also in in autoimmune and inflammatory diseases. So today I'm focusing uh, focusing on talking about the uh, regulation rules of the trend. This is a major uh, target. Any problem? So I will continue. Uh, so uh, the first for students, I want want to summary the fine turn of immune system, and uh, uh, we will separate in adaptive and innate immune system uh, suppressions. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yeah. No, okay. No so, for the in, uh, for the adaptive regulation, we have already learned about the FOXP3 positive T Rex, and also currently we have IL10 positive B Rex, and uh, these cells could produce uh, inhibitory cytokines, and also use some checkpoint molecules to suppress the effector T cell functions, and uh, in the innate part, uh, recently we have many. Uh, studies on the suppressor cell part. For example, the MDSC, the uh, myeloid-derived suppressor cells, 
and also uh, macrophage lineage are called M2 macrophage, which these two cells could produce some inhibitory cytokines and uh, also provide some suppression on immune regulation. And that, uh, however, the, the uh, regulators, the effector molecules in inner immune part is not clear. So uh, I think we have learned about the T-Rex suppression mechanisms uh, by previous uh, previous reports. So uh, you can see the inhibitory cytokines or induce the effect of cytolysis or use IL-2 depression or use uh, affecting the, the dendritic cell antigen presenting cell functions or could be mediated by T-Rex to suppress the T-cell activation. And for B-Rex cells, we have a high expression of IL-10, which is inhibiting cytokines, and also could cause the down regulation of macrophage antigen presenting cell or, or directly down regulate the T cell functions. So uh, for the macrophage suppressions, uh, uh, the doctor uh, Simon Golden has reported that uh, upon different stimulation of the environment, uh, the macrophage could be polarized into different type of response. So for example, the regular stimulation, the thorax stimulations could activate the macrophage become a, a pro-inflammatory one. And uh, also if the, if the infection combined with antibody or complements, this will make the macrophage response differently. And if we talk about the T cell uh, close to talk to the macrophage, we can find that Th1 cells produce interferon gamma, which will combine in combine with uh, toroid receptors, will make a classical activation of the macrophage, which is a pro inflammatory cytokine production. And also, a lot of our production will generate the tissue damage and also kill the bac bacteria. However, if you have a Th2 response, produce IL-4, IL-13, then these cytokines will turn the t uh, macrophage into an alternative activation situation, which provides uh, uh, tissue repairing and also uh, uh, anti-inflammation conditions. And also there are some uh, report shows that inhibitory cytokines combined with uh, like steroids treatments will make another type of immunosuppressors uh, in macrophages. So, uh, for example, in the tumor microenvironment, there is a type of cell called TAM, a tumor associated macrophage. This is a, a crucial type of macrophage which play a uh, anti-inflammation uh, functions. So uh, you, as you can see here, the mi microenvironment tumor could trigger a macrophage to turn into a tumor associated macrophage. And this type of macrophage actually provides the uh, help to the tumor growth and uh, make the uh, survival of tumor growth. And uh, the M1 and the M2 type of macrophage uh, actually interact with different type of immune cells. For example, M1 type uh, macrophage interact with the Th1 and the NK cells. And then this was pro-inflammatory part. And the M2 type of macrophage actually interact with Th2 cells, T-Rex cells, and also the B cells, B-Rex cells, and also neutral fields. And this could uh, uh, build up an uh, anti-inflammation network. So, uh, and recently there's a one uh, immu immune suppressor cells was reported, which is uh, also derived from a bone marrow and it's become a immature marrow cells. And then this could turn into immune suppressor cells. Uh, there are two types of immune suppressors MDSC uh, is uh, found. Uh, one type is a granulocytic NDSC, which express a uh, very uh, high level of RS and also high level of arginase. And uh, also another type is called monocytic NDSC, which produce a high level of inose and also high level of arginase. And this two type of NDSC could provide a different mechanism to suppress the effector cells and also uh, downregulate the dendritic cell functions. 
And in my lab, uh, we focus on study the inflammatory regulation pathways. So one major uh, uh, target of, of my lab is the triggering receptor expressed on myeloid cells. So uh, this is a uh, uh, immunoglobin-like superfamily members. And then there are many, uh, several members in this family. And all the uh, members in the train family has a uh, immunoglobin extracellular domain and a, a transmembrane domain and a short tail of intracellular domain. So these receptors are not going to uh, transduce signals by themselves. They also transduce signal by the adapter protein called DAP12. And uh, the first paper come out from uh, 2001 from uh, Marco Corona's group. They found that churn one molecule is upregulated during inflammation and they place a uh, inflammatory amplifier rule and it's called crucial mediator for uh, sepsis. And uh, the second year, the second member of Chen family, Chen 2 was found and also by Marco Corona. Uh, 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 Marco Corona's group, and uh, this molecule is very interesting. Is uh, specific expressed on dendritic cell, and also uh, play rules in microglia functions. So uh, this is the expression profile of trend molecules. So you see the trend one is expressed on macrophage and the neutral field granulocytes. Trend two molecule uh, expressed on the osteoclast and the microglia and also highly expressed on dendritic cells. So uh, the downstream signaling of trend is mediated by this DAP12 adapter and the downstream is uh, item motif containing adapter. So the downstream is from the SYK activation for f kappa b for MAP kinase and also for PI3K kinase activation. And uh, uh, in disease, this Chen family has been studied um, uh, and reported in many uh, re uh, reference. So uh, Chen one is expressed, highly expressed in several inflammatory disease, for example, an uh, infection disease or a lung inflammation disease, and also in the gut inflammation disease and also the systemic sepsis conditions. And uh, Chen two is uh, highly change expressed in the uh, uh, neuron related inflammation disease, for example, the multiple sclerosis, and also recently people are uh, invested the trend to rule in Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so uh, my group in collaborate with the uh, Dr. Tech Mac and Dr. Wen Chen Ye in uh, University of Toronto, we generated uh, trend knockout mice. Uh, we generate actually a whole whole members, uh, chain members, uh, knockout mice. So uh, by using this knockout mice, we studied then uh, their function in the disease model. So in uh, 2014, we published the first paper which used a uh, oral inoculation model of Kerberosella bacteria. Uh, then we found that uh, the mice with train, it's a white type mice, has a better survival than the knockout. So this suggests that the trend plays a protective rule. Trend one plays, plays a protective rule to against this uh, bacterial infection. And because it's an oral infection, so actually the, the trend rule plays in the intentional barrier. Okay, so uh, we found that uh, if we lost trend, one, and actually we found that the bacteria induced liver abscess is increased uh, than the, uh, higher than the white type mice. So we also investigated the churn one rule in the IBD model, which is an auto, uh, is a, in, uh, autoimmune uh, dot information model. And uh, this model is, uh, uh, could be separated into ulcerative colitis and the Crohn's disease. And uh, we, I, I am not going to show the detailed data today. And uh, you can find in the uh, website that there are many publications, including our group and the other groups, showing that Chen one plays important role in regulating the colitis. And that uh, the main role of Chen one is regulating macrophage functions and also regulates the informations. And also there, there is one report showing that the trend tool also regulate the uh, uh, 
mucosal inflammatory disease. Okay, so uh, in this model, it shows that trend two plays the anti-inflammation rules. So without trend two, the inflammation actually is higher. So, uh, so I'm going to show you some data in our lab uh, regarding this uh, CKD disease. So the CKD disease is actually is a, a very important disease in Taiwan. And uh, uh, CKD is because uh, a chronic inflammation uh, uh, situation in kidney and then finally the patients lost their kidney functions. So they need a, a kidney transplantation or dialysis to maintain their life. So uh, we use we use an uh, animal model called unilateral ureteral obstruction. Uh, this model is very easy to per, per, uh, produce, uh, easy to uh, produce, and uh, you can see that when we tied the ureteral one side, and then the urine is accumulated, and then it will damage the uh, renal tubule, and the, finally the whole uh, kidney tissue will become a sepsis. Uh, uh, will become um, a deposit with collagens and then become a scar uh, structure. And uh, uh, then the kidney will become hydronephrosis and the tubular will become dilation and then you will see a lot of extra matrix protein deposition in this uh, kidneys. And then we study uh, the trend members in this UO models after one week and two weeks, uh, both uh, trend one, trend two, and the trend three are highly expressed in the tissues. So in collaboration with Dr. Tang in the uh, 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 VGH TPE, and also the Dr. Xie in the academic syndicates, we are uh, percent or we uh, proceed the, the UO model in our trend knockout mice and then to study the trend knockout uh, effects on UO pathogenesis. And uh, what we found is, uh, uh, this is the previous understanding of the uh, disease progression. So uh, when you have the UO procedures, the uh, tissue will be infiltrated with uh, macrophages and then further induce inflammation and cause the tissue dam a tubular damage. And this tubular damage will then lead to the myofibroblast uh, differentiation accumulation in the uh, kidney. And then finally, this will cause a lot of uh, collagen depreciation. And then this will become a tissue fibrosis situation. So when we compare our trend one white type and knockout mice, then uh, this is a uh, data showing that trend one expression after a uh, uh, UO procedure is increased in white type kidney, but not in the knockout kidney. Okay, so this is uh, just gene expression control. And then what's the uh, pathogenesis in white type knockout mice difference? So you can see that in white type mice, we successfully induce a lot of uh, renal damage in the UO mice. And uh, but in white trend one knockout mice, we didn't see a lot of tissue damage and it was significantly reduced. And uh, also in the uh, MPO in the fibrosis data, you can see that this alpha SMA is a marker for myofibroblast. And you see that in white time mice, we have uh, accumulation of myofibroblast and a lot of uh, collagen deposition here. And uh, for the Chen one knockout, we have a significantly less uh, deposition in the kidney uh, tissue. And uh, we have to identify what's the um, mechanism mediated by Chen one to contribute this. So previously we found that the Chen one expressed on macrophage. So we focus on macrophage function. And the previous also show you that macrophage could be polarized into M1 and M2. So then we ask whether Chen one could knock out, could affect the uh, uh, M1 and 2 macrophage infiltration and also M1 and 2 polarization. What we found is Actually, Chen one knockout in after UO, the macrophage infiltration is still comparable to the Y type, but the inos positive uh, M1 macrophage was significantly re reduced compared to Y type mice. 
and also other M1 markers, for example, the inflammatory cytokines and the inos and the IL-6 and IL-1 beta, they are all reduced in Chen one knockout kidneys after UO. However, for trend, uh, for the N2 situation, the N2 cell will use uh, arginase one as an N2 marker. And you see that in Y type, there are less N2 cells, but in Chen one knockout, we have a strongly M2 macrophage accumulation. So, and also the N2 markers, arginase one, YM1, IL-10, and the minus receptor, they are all upregulated in the Chen one knockout uh, kidneys. So, uh, so, over here, we show you that Chen one knockout will actually reduce the pathogenesis of UO nephritis, and because the uh, uh, controlling of M one and two polarization. So in all, uh, we this with data we already published in the Kidney International, and uh, this data actually show you that Chen one probably uh, probably play a important role on controlling M1 macrophage polarization. So how about Chen2? We also adapt the UO uh, model in the Chen2 knockout mice. And the Chen2 is also upregulated in UO kidneys after 14 days. And uh, we compare the Chen2 uh, the UO pathogenesis in Y type and the Chen2 knockout mice. And uh, we see that in Chen2 knockout mice, after UO, they actually have higher uh, cell infiltration and also higher uh, fibrosis conditions. So they actually, the disease become a, a severe uh, than the, the Y type mice. So what's the problem over here? Because trend one and trend two are also uh, mediated signals through the DEP12. So usually people think this are the activating receptors. But why the difference are uh, showing here? Trend one is reduced, trend, trend one not got reducing the information, but trend two not got upregulated the information. So we then focus on the tissue sections and we found one interesting thing is. In the trend two UO kidneys, we found a lot of this type of cell, the fragmented uh, fragmented nuclear cell type, which is mean indicated they are uh, uh, neutral fields. So we further confirm that in the trend two UO kidneys, we have uh, more neutral fields by the flow cytometry and also by the IHC analysis, and also we analyze the chemotaxics uh chemokines for neutral fields and we found that in chain two UO kidneys we have a high level of CCL3 and a high level of CCR1, which is the chemokine signal to re uh infiltrate to attract the neutral fields. And uh, so now we know that the the uh neutral fields are increased in the UO trend to knock out my kidneys. Whether this is the uh, reason to for the severe tissue damage. So we use the anti uh, neutral field antibody for depression. And we found that when we treat the mice with this Y6G neutralized antibody, we could deplete the neutral field and it shows that the tubular injury was reduced to uh, back to the Y type situation uh, due to the removal of neutral field. So the neutral field actually play important role for the enhance of the tissue damage over here. So why uh, in trend to knockout, we have a neutral field infiltration condition. So uh, then we think about uh, what's the uh, immune process control neutral fields? So neutral fields are mediated by enhanced chemokines. So we just show that. And the upstream of chemokine induction, uh, we found that IO-17 and the TH-17 cells could be an uh, important target. So uh, future, we studied the kidney tissue RNA, and we found that IO-17 indeed uh, uh, RNA signal are upregulated so then we further analyze the TH17 percentage and also the T cell percentage and also the IL-17 cytokines and also the upstream cytokines which differentiate TH17. And we found that in total T cell ratios, there's no significant difference. And but when we cross link the T cell with anti-CD3, anti-CD28, then we found that the 
uh, TH17, which is IL-17 positive cells, are higher compared to the white type. And also the supernatant has contains higher IL-17 cytokines. However, the upstream cytokines we know for important for the TH3 a TH17 differentiation, for example, TGF beta, IL6, and IL1 beta was not significantly changed uh, between white type and not got after UO. So this is uh, very strange. We have to find out why the trend to knockout will contribute to an increase of neutral field, an increase of TH17, but mm, uh, Currently, the known factors are not changed. So then we found a, a reference showing that when you deplete the uh, dendritic cell in the kidney uh, model, you could deplete the TH17 uh, production in the kidney. So this means that dendritic cell is critical for TH7 induction in this renal obstruction models. And that, uh, if you remember, trend two is highly expressed on dendritic cells. So this links to our model to this. And then also there's a, a just map paper published in 2013 showing that the inose induced, uh, inose mediated uh, uh, NO, the nitrate X oxide was important to control TH17 differentiation. So we try to link dendritic cell, inos, and the chain 2 together. So we uh, analyzed our dendritic cell from white type and the knockout and uh, identify their uh, inos expression. And we found that in chain 2 knockout dendritic cells, after stimulation, they express very low inos compared to white type dendritic cells. And uh, also we show that uh, the uh, NO induction also reduced in the uh, chain 2 knockout dendritic cells. And uh, we also uh, further co-incubate the white type and knockout dendritic cell with T cells to trigger the TH17 differentiation. And we found that white type dendritic cell could induce TH17 differentiation, but knockout dendritic cell will induce more TH17 differentiation in our models. So. Uh, our data showing that trend two properly controls the inos and uh, use the NO, then uh, controls the TH17 differentiation. So we also uh, establish a uh, knockdown dendritic cell lines to showing the uh, this this uh, trend two control the inos induction. Uh, uh, mechanism and this we established the chain two knockdown cell compared to the scramble and uh, uh, we found that in the chain two knockout situ knockdown situation, dendritic cells produce less inos in response to to the LPS induction and also the less NO induction. Okay, so it's correlated to our knockout cell uh, finding, and so our um. Model is when you uh, work in the white type UO, the dendritic cell express the uh, trend two, and then they will induce the inos and then generate NO. This NO will actually uh, modify the our gamma T, provide a nitrosylation situation, which block our gamma T function, which lead to the down regulation of IL-17 production, and then lead to a uh, control of neutral field. However, in the trend two knockout uh, cells, the GD cells, the inos is not induced, the NO is not produced, then our gamma T are free, so they could induce a lot of IL-17 and uh, generate a lot of kind of chemicals, induce a lot of neutral fields, infiltrate into the kidneys, induce the more tissue damages. And uh, also, we also found a, a reference showing that if we supplement the air arginine, which is substrate for inos, which could induce, enhance the NO production in the kidneys, which may per, play a protective role to reduce the renal inflammation. So we adapted this uh, a model to test whether we supplement the arginine could re recover the disease in the chain 2 knockout. So we provide arginine to the chain 2 knockout mice after UO, then we find that in the urine, the uh, NO production was uh, increased. And uh, with the higher NO, we found that the, uh, compared to the UO situation, the uh, tissue damage was reduced and uh, also 
uh, the collagen area was reduced. And also when we uh, study the uh, alpha SMA is also a collagen as a, a myofibroblast marker is also reduced. And uh, not only this, we also found that in the tissue damage with the arginine treatment, we can see there are lower, uh, less neutral field infiltration and also less MPO, less neutral field markers here. So, and also less chemokines uh, uh, data here. So uh, in our model, we show you that uh, trend two depression could uh, cause a reduction or reduction of inos in dendritic cells and then reduce the NO production, which may mediate, uh, NO could mediate our gamma inhibition. So the trend two depletion will actually uh, enhance the our gamma activity, then enhance the IL-17, and then finally enhance the neutral field, cause more tissue damage in our model. So uh, finally, I would, uh, uh, Thank for my uh, lab members uh, uh, who do the work in the talk. Okay, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chen, for your brilliant talk. I would like to apologize from Dr. Sunil Arora. Uh, Friday, yesterday being a very busy day in the clinic, I hadn't seen the new email that you had sent with all the details and all the details of every speaker. I apologize on behalf of uh, my own problems, and I That's hope you fine. will. Um, so now um, I have time. Actually, question answer should have come after the third lecture, but now we will start the uh, question answer um, entirely dealing with Dr. Chen's uh, talk. And other question answers which were asked from uh, Dr. Ganguly and Dr. Agarwal will be sent to them, and I hope they will reply to those who have asked the question. So the questions from uh, Dr. Chen. I replied all the questions on the chat box to all the persons who have asked. Okay, so that will be on the chat box. Question for this uh, talk by Professor Chen. Any yes. observation regarding TREM1 and SPIC transcription factor, SPIC interaction? Okay, a uh, spicy. Uh, in our study, we didn't uh, focus on spicy, but actually, uh, in my uh colleague, uh, they study the spicy functions, and uh, they found that uh spicy is upregulated in the thymus, uh, uh, macrophage, and also in the spring macrophages. So, uh, the correlation between chun one and the spicy currently is uh. Not, not clear, so maybe we can focus on that and then check and screen it for, for, for expression. Yeah. That was Dr. Arya's question. The next question is by Dr. Sandhya Rani. Any role of TREM1 and TREM2 in Crohn's disease? Okay, uh, TREM1 uh, expression is upregulated in Crohn's disease. This is uh, uh, clear. And then uh, in previous report, they also show that if you use a Chen one knockout in a Crohn's disease model, they also show some uh, protection effects. So when you remove Chen one you could see reduction of information in the Crohn's diseases. So, uh, but actually uh, there are many different uh, pathways or mechanism was identified in the uh, IBD model by using the Chen one knockout and the Chen two knockouts currently. So it's still not conclusive now, but uh, you can search for the reference I show you and then uh, you can find the details, especially in the, uh, uh, what's that? JCI paper, that's a uh, very detailed insight, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Yes. Um, Professor Arora, any other, um, should I open the chat also? Yeah, that's about it. No, that's okay. You can ask some uh, panelists uh, if they want to ask any question. Then Surely, uh, Dr. Ganguly, Professor Agarwal, um, any questions uh, to uh, Professor Chen? I don't hear. Um... I don't, yeah, um, I, I, I think you can close down the session. Thank you. Um, and again, my apologies, Dr. <laughs> Professor Sunil Arora. Um, I didn't see your email, which came yesterday with all the details. My deep apologies. 
And Please thank, don't. Thank you for helping me. And it was indeed a pleasure to meet some of my old friends on this uh, chat uh, and program and wonderful discussions. And I have updated my own knowledge of autoimmunity, basic immunology, including the talk by Professor Chen um, on the pathobiology of uh, chronic kidney disease. Thank you very much. Uh, we close the meeting at this place. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for uh, moderating this very important session on autoimmunity. Uh, you were the best person I, I, I thought uh, who can do this because we had clinical immunologists and you are the guru among all that. So, <laughs> uh, right? my apology <laughs> for the mess up, but anyway, thank you. Uh, thank you. Amita Dipeman, and finally, Dr. Chen was very good. I mean, it is wonderful work he has shown, and it is first time I have heard somebody from Taiwan uh, talking about uh, autoimmunity and all. So, Dr. Chen, thank you very much for joining and uh, for a wonderful talk. All the speakers were great and everything uh, went well. Thank you very much. We break for lunch. Uh, now that uh, it's almost 1.40, so we'll join back at 2.40. Although the session starts at 2.30, we'll have another 10 minutes. So we'll, we'll start session at 2.40. Everyone uh, welcome back after lunch. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Chen. Very nice. Thank you. Good one.